Welcome to the Project School of Podcast. I'm your host, Brian Murphy, and we're breaking through the barrier of scientific belief. With us today, we have Professor Walid Al-Ansari. He is a professor of Islamic studies at Xavier University, and he's here to talk about a book that he's working on. Uh, it's an economics book that argues that major religious traditions offer a holistic approach to production and exchange processes that have significant meaning for economic theories. Professor El Anzari holds a PhD in Islamic and Religious Studies from George Washington University and a Master of Arts in Economics from the University of Maryland. His research focuses on the intersection of religion, science, and economics. He has authored numerous publications, including Islamic Environmental Economics and the Three Dimensions of Islam. In his co-edited volume, Muslim and Christian Understanding, Theory and Application of a Common Word. So with that, uh, I'll turn it over to Walid. Walid, welcome to the show. Oh, thank you very much, Brian. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Well, let me ask you first, how did you come across the work of Dr. Wolfgang Smith? Well, actually, I came across it through my mentor and uh, dissertation advisor, uh, Dr. Sayed Hussein Nasser at George Washington University. And I first took classes with him as an undergraduate uh, all the way back in the 1980s. And I was just blown away uh, by his discussion of Islamic science, not just Muslims who do science. And in the course of that, I was introduced to the work of Wolfgang Smith and um, you know the distinction between the corporeal and physical realms. And uh, it was just uh, really a godsend to me because as Wolfgang Smith mentions, if we don't have that distinction in mind, we kind of live in a schizophrenic universe. And that's especially important in the Islamic tradition because Islam is based on the soteriological function of knowledge, the saving function of knowledge, kind of like when Christ said, you know, the truth shall set you free. And um, I had been throughout my education kind of uh, in high school and junior high school and so forth, kind of trapped in this, uh, in scientism, uh, not knowing the distinction between science and scientism. And so the discovery of Wolfgang Smith's work through um, Dr. Noss was just a uh, uh, very liberating for me. And of course, uh, viewers familiar with the film, The End of Quantum Reality, that features uh, Dr. Wolfgang Smith, uh, will know that Professor Nasser features uh, prominently in that film, where uh, the former president of the Philosophia Initiative Foundation, uh, our former president, Rick Delano, interviewed him uh, in his office there. And he he has a background in physics as well, doesn't he? That's right. Physics from MIT, geophysics and geology from Harvard, and PhD in history and philosophy of science from Harvard. Incredible. Now, you said that you used to be immersed in what you said that you called scientism. How do you understand scientism, or how did you understand it at the time, or, or maybe how did you wake up and realize that you didn't actually believe in something called science, where the things that you thought were science were not, but scientism? Right. Well, um, we first of all have to define, of course, modern science as empirical means of knowing the material world, and scientism being the claim that modern science defined as empirical means of knowing the material world has a monopoly on knowledge. And so that, of course, excludes the whole idea that nature is a sacred text that is there to be read. I mean, the Quran states that God is al-Hakim, which is the all-wise. And so nature necessarily has to reflect that wisdom. And so the purpose of science in the Islamic tradition is not about power or wealth and, and so forth, although it can help in those regards. But the ultimate purpose is to understand the wisdom of God's creation. And that has a spiritually transformative effect on the person who knows it. And it's ultimately really a divine gift. Um, and so both the verses of the Quran are called Ayatollah as well as the phenomena in nature is called ayatullah. So really the notion of ayatullah in the Quran binds 
religion and science together. And when I had first heard of uh, the idea of quantum mechanics destroying this billiard ball particle theory of, of the universe, that was extremely liberating for me because now I could, for the first time, understand nature as ayatollah law rather than looking at it, at it as a bunch of you know molecular structures. Did you have an understanding of how logical positivism played into your understanding of science or was that discussed? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, logical positivism being self-refuting itself and, um, and the same thing with scientism. Um, it's kind of like saying to someone, there's no such thing as language. <laughs> and, and so once I understood that it was a, scientism was simply bad philosophy, not good science, um, it opened the door to the understanding of basically the true interconnections between religion and science. And Wolfgang Smith's work was extremely helpful in that regard. Well, I know you're a fan of T.S. Eliot, and yeah. uh, I have a I have a book here, a little book from uh, from our friend John Trevor Berger called Leisure: The Basis of Culture. And the foreword is written by T.S. Eliot, and he talks in here about um, logical positivism, and he compares it to surrealism. And he says he says about it, for as surrealism seemed to provide a method of producing works of art without imagination. So logical positivism seems to provide a method of philosophizing without insight and wisdom. I, I'm sure you'd share that that view. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So after your undergrad, you moved on to study economics right. at the University of Maryland. Yes, my my undergraduate degree in uh, at in uh, George Washington was uh, economics with a minor in philosophy. And the reason that I basically decided to go into economics was because I'm originally from Egypt. And when we would go to Egypt, when I was a kid uh, in junior high school, I saw that there was a great deal of poverty there. Um, and of course it was related to the war and so forth, but it really made a strong impression on me. I, we had plenty of physicists, uh, plenty of doctors, physicians and engineers in our family. But looking at the poverty in Egypt, I decided to go into economics um, and try, especially focusing on development economics, thinking that that would be part of the solution. But as I uh, learned uh, from Seyd Hussein Nasser, all the problems of modernity and the interconnections between religion, science, and economics, I began to realize that modern economic theory and practice is really part of the problem. It's not the solution. And so that's what directed or redirected my research. Professor Wolfgang Smith makes a distinction between profane sciences and sacred sciences. Is that something that you would have understood back then, or is that part of your thinking as well? Yeah, back then, um, really uh, taking courses with the uh, Dr. Nostr was essential, uh, particularly his course on religion and science, which I had sat in on four different times. Uh, one is an undergraduate for credit, and then another time as a graduate student also for credit. But uh, I would attend those lectures uh, every time that he offered uh, the course on religion and science, even if it wasn't for credit, because each time he hits um, the subject from somewhat different angles. And so you gain new insights uh, as you take the course. So uh, after getting the recordings of the course from students, I've actually participated in, in even if indirectly, uh, through seven versions of that course. <laughs> and so uh, certainly the idea of a sacred science is Dr. Nasser has written actually a book entitled The Need for a Sacred Science. And so that is very much part of um, the work that I'm uh, doing on, um, you might call it sacred economics, because economics takes its axioms from higher sciences, including ultimately physics. And so, which informs 
both production processes as well as the analytical tools of, of economic theory. And so um, you might say that there is a tremendous need for sacred economics understood in light of Wolfgang Smith's work on quantum mechanics. Okay, I want to come back to your notion of sacred economics and uh, sort of build up to your book. Um, when we met, it was probably two years ago, two and a half years ago, you were presenting a course on symbology. And I, I had it in my notes. I've lost my notes since, but it was quite a lengthy name of the course, but it was so very interesting. It was something I hadn't, it was really very early on when I was being introduced to Wolfgang Smith's work. It's the first time I'd come to know Said Hossein Nasser, first time I met you. And can you describe, um, if you, I hope you remember which one I was speaking of, but it's a course you did on, on symbology and, and the, the, how, how the lower reflects the higher. And if you could describe that, because this obviously informs how you go about um, this book on economics. Yes. Uh, well, every semester I teach a course entitled Religion in an Age of Science here at Xavier University. And of course, one of the uh, goals of the Jesuits, this is a Jesuit Catholic university, is to find God in all things. And so the first distinction that we make in the course is between science and scientism. And to refute that, as material means of finding the uh, uh, empirical means of knowing the material world. And then we turn to Wolfgang Smith's thought uh, that basically undermines the whole idea that there is strictly a material world out there to be, to apply the empirical means to. Uh, and so uh, based on that distinction, we introduce uh, Wolfgang Smith's work very early on in the course and discuss vertical causality, and basically discuss how numbers actually symbolize God, their vestigia day. And so the number one, for example, it's very easy to discuss it in Arabic, because the number one in Arabic is called wahid. And God, as one of his qualities, is called the one, which is in Arabic, al-ahad, uh, and al-wahid. Um, and just as the number one is the principle of all other numbers, you might say it's the mother of all other numbers, so is God, as the creator, al Khalik in Arabic, the uh, creator of all things. And there's another verse in the Quran that says, inna lillahi wa inna lillahi raji'un, which means it is from God that we come, and verily it's to God we will return. And uh, when you multiply one and one, you get one. If you multiply 11 and 11, two ones, you get 121. When you multiply 111 squared, it's one, two, three, two, one. And you can keep on going up to nine, 111 million, 111,000, 111 squared is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, eight, nine, seven, six, four, four, three, two, one. And so that kind of symbolizes from the one do we come and to the one we return. And so the mathematical properties of numbers actually exhibit metaphysical uh, properties uh, and it's derived from them. So we can relate and see numbers as ayatollah, the same thing, or, or vestigia day, if we we're going to use the Latin. And the same applies to the number zero, which also has a symbolism, and to two and three. And I'd be happy to go into those if you like, but. Um, I think the number one just gives an, an easy example to understand. So symbolism is extremely important. It's a common language between religion and science. And um, of course, I also uh, discuss the root of symbolism. It's symboline in Greek, which means to bind levels of reality. And diaboline is means to deny the interconnections between religion, between different levels of reality. And so really modern science in that, to the extent that it denies vertical causality and is based purely on horizontal causality and therefore denies the link between levels of reality is really a diabolical science 
in the etymological sense of the term. Could you say that again? Diabolene means to deny the link. The between, link between different levels of reality, the connection between different levels of reality. That's fascinating. That's very, very fascinating. So I have I have to ask um, your students. Uh, could you describe your student body? Are they how do they react to the this um, these courses that you give? Um, I'm I'm really interested. I I went to Catholic schools. I didn't have the benefit of of this type of a course. Um, I'm just curious how you know, do they come from secular backgrounds? Are they steeped in scientism? Are they receptive to this? Do they seem to understand it? Maybe you can give me a, I'm just curious how they, they receive this. Sure. Well, the distinction between science and scientism is, is pretty clear. And I always ask the students, are we making sense? Uh, just to kind of invite any questions or uh, clarify any issues that they may have. Um, and the distinction between science and scientism is very much an eye-opening experience for them, as it was for me when I first uh, learned about it. And um, then we go into, uh, as I mentioned, uh, Dr. Smith's uh, uh, discussion of quantum mechanics, because if modern science is claiming to you know, apply empirical means to the study of the material world, and quantum mechanics basically denies that there are those little billiard ball particles out there to begin with, that really uh, provides a, a refutation of scientism from a from the perspective of quantum mechanics. And then we go into um, issues of fine tuning of the cosmos and uh, and therefore the idea of a fine tuned cosmos introduces the idea of a fine tuner, which once again uh, suggests vertical causality and all the mechanisms that are used to basically propose the idea of a multiverse to just get away from the idea of a creator who is fine-tuned our universe um, themselves as Stephen Meyer points out um, require fine-tuning so there's no way to get around the issue of fine-tuning and therefore there's a fine-tuner and that relates to vertical causality we then go into the symbolism of Schott Cathedral which uh, examines the liberal arts uh, which are or, embodies the liberal arts defined as number in uh in terms of the quadrivium with arithmetic which is number outside of space and time then geometry which is number in space music which is number in time and astronomy which is number in space and time for the benefit of listeners i'm going to ask you to repeat that sure you began speaking about Chartres cathedral and the relationship between number and uh, a correlated meaning. Yes. All right. So after our discussion of the fine tuning of the cosmos and quantum mechanics and the need for vertical causality based on the work that uh, Wolfgang Smith, Dr. Smith has uh, done, and I assigned some uh, certain excerpts of from his books to the students to introduce them to his thought. We then start to discuss the symbolism of numbers uh, as vestigia day or ayatollah, as we would say in Arabic, and how the mathematical properties of numbers actually reflect metaphysical properties, as we discussed in the number one. And the same thing applies to the number zero, which I think I'd like to give an example of now, in that uh, the way that we write zero in Arabic is with a dot. So the geometric analog to the number zero is uh, a dot. And if you extend the geometric point, uh, you get a line. And if you extend the line, you get a plane. And if you extend the plane, you get three-dimensional space. And so the geometric point is the no thing, not nothing, but the no thing that generates everything. And so zero stands above the series of numbers in the same way that the essence of God stands above everything else. And so if we conceive of the cosmos as plenitude, 
will think of the essence, the divine essence, as void, which is why when we add or subtract zero to any number, it stays the same. And if we divide any number by zero, it explodes because God is what makes things great. But if we multiply anything by zero, it reduces it to nothing because the essence of God compared to anything else reduces it to nothing. And then finally, if we add enough zeros to our paycheck, we can have a small fortune. <laughs> and, so, <laughs> and so these mathematical properties are really derived from the metaphysical properties. And that introduces the relationship between quality and quantity, that numbers are not reducible to their quantitative dimension alone. They are qualities, they are related to qualities uh, and ultimately to God and the divine and his divine names and qualities. And so from that point of view, we go from there to from sacred mathematics, you might say, to examine how that sacred arithmetic informs sacred geometry, sacred music, and sacred astronomy, all of which are embodied in Shakt Cathedral. And so we introduce the students to that symbolism in Shakt Cathedral. And the school of Shakt was not that far, obviously, from the school of Paris and had an influence there. And St. Ignatius of Loyola and St. Francis Xavier studied at the uh, in, in Paris, the School of Paris, and this is the way we introduce what St. Ignatius of Loyola and St. Francis Xavier would have learned when they were at the University of Paris. Is this, uh, is St. Saint Francis Xavier the same uh, Xavier for which the university you work at is named? Or oh, is yes, yes. Same no, Xavier? Yeah, okay. I'm sorry, I should have clarified. I, I, I teach oh. at Xavier University, and actually that's the reason why it's so, uh, I mean, I, I really love teaching at a Jesuit Catholic institution precisely because the mission of the Jesuits, one of their missions, is to find God in all things. And they, the early Jesuits, would have received this uh, type of education regarding sacred arithmetic, sacred geometry, sacred music, and sacred astronomy, which then provides a very easy way for me to um, introduce the students to these subjects in a way that I could not do at a secular university or even a non-Catholic university. I just have one question as an aside. I went to a Jesuit high school. Do they have jugs at Jesuit colleges? Do they issue jugs? This is detention called justice under God. J jug. <laughs> if you got jug, you were in detention. So right. I don't. I, I, I had my share, my share of jug. Yeah. <laughs> No, presumably, uh, no, we, we don't have jugs here. Okay. I'm not even sure if it would be legal. <laughs> <laughs> so um, it's so fascinating, your description of the number zero in, in Islam as a point, which has its correlation to, of course, Pythagorean uh, arithmetic or ge geometry, and also Wolfgang Smith's cosmic icon, the center point, which at the center is a point uh, with a line that de demarks the the uh, the plane extending out to the circumference. Of course, that center point reflects the ab eternal, what he calls the ab eternal realm in Platonic terms. It's not the eternal, but it's connected to it. Um, it derives, let's say, from God uh, through an intermediary um, out to the circumference, which is the corporeal. So there is, it seems to be a lot of... Um, uh, uh, similarities between you know independent symbology but they all seem to to correlate yes as keith critchlow says geometry is the um is related to the ever true and so all of these metaphysical um doctrines are are ultimately coming from the same source so your book uh, offers an ontological 
interpretation of the way economics should be, if I might put it that way. And what I mean is, um, you say it, it um, you're deriving your thought from Wolfgang Smith's work, he offers an ontology to physics. Is it fair to say that by ontology, we mean a metaphysical interpretation of the physical sciences? Yes, yes, absolutely. So we're saying that there are different levels of being. That's what we mean by ontology for those unfamiliar with the term. Um, and of course, Wolfgang Smith's resolution to the quantum enigma is that there is a, a transformation, an instantaneous transformation from a physical system uh, represented in the Schrodinger equation to a corporeal entity uh, upon measurement. It's instantaneous. It's a transition from one, let's say, substrat, sub, um, subcorporeal uh, level of being to a corporeal level of being. And this is the only way to resolve, to his mind, the quantum enigma is to acknowledge that there is an ontological shift that's immediate. And therefore, physics requires an ontology in order to understand it correctly. And so what you've done, and you know, you can jump in and correct me if I'm wrong, what you've done is saying is said that this is this is necessary also for economics in order to uh, come out of, let's say, the the problems that we have uh, in our culture, uh, in our country, with uh, let's say distribution of goods and services, or how those decisions are made, or how people interact in the economic sphere, requires an ontology in order to do it right. Is that a fair representation? And I'll I'll let you go from there. Yes, that is. Um, uh, I would add that basically this this ontology allows for the distinction between holistic work, which is spiritually, psychologically, and materially efficacious, versus deformed work uh, that is only materially efficacious in the short run, uh, which leaves the uh, spiritual objectives of work. Uh, underdeveloped you might say and the reason that deformed work will only fulfill material needs in the short run is because the deformed work does violence to both man and nature and so deformed work is ultimately leads to a deformed economy in which the environmental crisis is inevitable. And so deviations from that theological ideal of holistic work that fulfills a hierarchy of spiritual and other needs, if those are unfulfilled, then we turn our attention to basically devour the world the, the, of nature and therefore lead to its destruction it's a kind of collective suicide and unfortunately the corporations who benefit from basically externalizing the costs by polluting to the public uh, do not pay for those costs that are uh, generated by their production processes. And they basically contribute to politicians' campaigns, com uh, campaigns in order to ensure the longevity of those uh, pollution uh, processes. So we have what economists call market failures on one hand, in which the full prices the full costs of the products are not included in the price compounded by government failure to correct those because the corporations who benefit from those negative externalities or such as pollution uh, contribute to their campaigns and so we have a combination of market failure and government failure that leads to intractable problems in uh, the environmental crisis as well as socioeconomic instability. 
And so the solution to this is basically to recover holistic work and establish a holistic economy, which is does not do violence to man and nature because it takes a much more integrated approach to both. And so Wolfgang Smith's work provides the ontological basis by which to understand the symbolism of the products that we make and the beauty, how the beauty of them uh, is combined with their corporeal uses. And that corresponds to the world of nature in which God's art, so to speak, is both beautiful and materially beneficial. And so in that sense, our work, our art, should do the same thing, be both beautiful to fulfill our spiritual needs and materially efficacious to fill our, fulfill our corporeal needs. And so the only way to do that is through is by integrating holistic science with holistic technology, holistic economics, and other uh, socioeconomic structures to generate a holistic economy that is both environmentally sustainable and leads to socioeconomic equilibrium. Now, what what um, could you describe, or what what things go into holistic work? What makes it holistic, as opposed to deformed? Right. Well, what makes it holistic is that the work symbolizes higher levels of reality. The craftsman or craftswoman who is making that uh, artifact combines both beauty and corporeal use values that depend on an inward vision of the symbols and what they symbolize. And so God's art or nature represents an exteriorization, you might say, whereas our art and crafts re represent an interiorization, a return to the center of our being. And so therefore, uh, a, metaphysic, a knowledge of metaphysics and cosmological sciences is necessary to produce such holistic production and exchange processes. Holistic production processes basically generate holistic exchange processes. And in all religious traditions, the division of labor itself represents a spiritual, has a spiritual meaning. Because if each person did not practice a particular profession, then the society as a whole would be without it, such as uh, lack of hospitals or lack of orphanages and so forth. And therefore, the entire society would be held spiritually accountable by God for that absence. And so in a holistic economy, what we have is mutual respect and appreciation for one another, because we know that each one of us is practicing a profession that fulfills a communal obligation and therefore fulfills a spiritual responsibility. The division of labor is not simply a right, as it's conceived of by Adam Smith and other economists, but is actually a duty. 
and therefore it engenders mutual respect, the principle of reciprocity, and the idea of self-respect, which transcends the notions of egoism and altruism that economists discuss. Because self-respect entails love of neighbor as oneself, but of course, in the light of the love of God, which is greater than both the love of ourselves as well as the neighbor. And so once we have self-respect, we wish for the other person what we wish for ourselves, but equally important is that we do not feel an obligation to give to the neighbor that which we ourselves would not deserve if we were in that neighbor's place. And so we have this I, doctrine of, of fair wages, fair prices, just wages, just prices, uh, all of which goes into this holistic economy. Did I answer your question uh, adequately, or was there a focus that you wanted to get at more precisely? No, you you definitely answered the question, and I think um, it's it's engendering more conversation because um, you know you brought up Adam Smith, and I think maybe I can capture Adam Smith's argument that individuals pursuing self-interest, um, you know, altruistic. Uh, occurrences are sort of a byproduct of the exchange, whereas it seems like you're making the argument that uh, an altruistic motive should be central, or I don't know if altruistic is the right word, but let's say a service to God is, uh, or or a higher um, higher purpose should be primary, and then the exchange secondary. Um, I, I think um, so, so the the main argument that say Adam Smith and Friedrich Hayek and others make is is that uh, individuals pursuing their self-interest um, create efficient um, exchanges which benefits everybody sort of the rising tide floats all boat argument um, uh, yes and uh, sorry go ahead um, so no go ahead you, you I think you can you can take it from there yeah and there's a very serious flaw in their arguments I mean Matt Adam Smith for example, um, basically claims that the only aim of production is consumption. In which case, production processes lose their spiritual significance. Or their, in other words, it's no longer holistic work. And he uses the famous example of the pin factory in which uh, each individual, one individual cuts the wire, another individual straightens it, another individual puts the head on the uh, on the pin and so forth and so on. And in the first edition of The Wealth of Nations, uh, Adam Smith used that example of a high division of labor uh, to basically demonstrate how that increases productivity. However, in the second edition of The Wealth of Nations, he realized that if a person is doing that day in and day out, he basically says, and I'm quoting, uh, uh, paraphrasing him, that he, that person becomes as stupid as it's possible for a human creature to be. And so he suggested that uh, people do things outside of work, such as read poetry or, or things like that, uh, that would recover or restore their humanity that was lost in the production processes. And John Ruskin, who is a critic of basically secular approaches to political economy, argued that workers will simply not be capable of doing these other activities to restore their humanity after a day on the assembly line. And so Adam Smith's proposal to uh, convert deformed or to ameliorate the effects of deformed work uh, simply don't work <laughs> no pun intended <laughs> but, and and uh, in addition to that they fail to make the distinction or 
between self-respect and self-interest. Self-interest can be, some economists define self-interest in a very broad way, uh, as opposed to a narrow way. They can talk about the self-interest of saints, for example, no, uh, Milton Friedman in his Nobel Prize uh, acceptance address for the Nobel Prize, basically said that the most money grubby money uh, grubbing miser pursues his self interests just as a saint prefers his or her self interest, and so self interest in that uh, context means pursuing whatever goals interest that particular person. So self-interest can be very widely defined, and that is not problematic from a from a spiritual point of view. But it's often defined more narrowly in exchange between two individuals. So for example, a mother who is buying milk for her baby is being altruistic to the baby, but is being uh, self-interested with respect to the grocer who is selling the milk. Wants, the mother obviously wants to get the best deal. And so economics is sometimes uh, viewed in terms of non-tuism, the idea that we may be altruistic outside of our exchanges, but we are uh, self-interested in a narrow sense with respect to the parties that we engage in transactions with. Um, but that dichotomy is transcended by self-respect. Self-respect subsumes self-interest by basically not feeling obligated to give to the neighbor that which we would not deserve if we were in the neighbor's place. And so the proper approach to the mother's exchange with the grocer should be one of concern that the grocer is getting a fair price. It's not to simply, and that is a form of self-respect. So on the one hand, the mother is not interested in overpaying, but it, by the same token is not interested in underpaying the grocer. So that both sides have self-respect and the grocer should not be interested in trying to maximize the price that the grocer gets from the mother, but wants to also give the mother a fair price. So self-respect transcends this dichotomy between egoism on one hand and altruism on the other. So may I ask, are you proposing, and I haven't, you haven't finished the book yet and you're, you're still in the process, but are you proposing a, a type of new economic system or a change in how we conscientiously go about our work, sort of getting people to uh, have better informed consciousness about why they engage in transactions in the marketplace. Um, of course, we don't want to overspend for things. Um, we have to be cognizant that there are always people out there trying to get more from us than we should pay. But I, I guess it sounds to me like, am I correct in saying that you're trying to make people more aware and conscious about their decisions as they go about their work in the market? And then that's just on the individual basis, but then how do you, how you go to the next level up? How do you address this at the corporate level? Yes, no, that's a very important question. Um, basically, everything has to start at the level of production processes. If production processes are not spiritually significant, or if they're not based on holistic work, you might say, then it's going to be extremely difficult to reintroduce self-respect into the system of exchanges. That doesn't mean that nobody will be able to do it, but once we 
adopt deformed work rather than holistic work, in a sense, society has committed itself to a secular philosophical ethics because no religion and no virtue ethics associated with the religion would ever sacrifice whole work for deformed work. And therefore, once a society commits to deformed work and thereby secular philosophical ethics, it becomes extremely difficult to reintroduce ethics into back into the system because secular philosophical ethics, whether it's a duty based ethics like Kantian ethics or a desire based ethics like utilitarianism, neither one of those positions are intellectually sustainable. These philosophers of, of, of ethics are extremely good at pointing out the errors in the position of their of the alternatives, but they cannot put uh, themselves forward proper alternatives or intellectually sustainable alternatives. So what we have, in a sense, is philosophical different schools of secular philosophical ethics mutually nullifying one another and so to use the phrase of uh, Alistair McIntyre it's either the way of Aristotle which is associated with virtue ethics or the way of Nietzsche which is no ethics at all really and there's no middle position and therefore when we try to reintroduce ethics into a system that's based on deformed work, it is simply not possible if, since that society has already committed itself to a secular worldview based on the adoption of deformed work. And this is particularly important in the case of pollution and negative externalities. We have known about, I remember the first Earth Day when I was in elementary school. And we are now, you know, nearly 50 years later, in a much worse position than we were then, even though we knew that there are enormous collective action problems that we need to face regarding the environment. And the reason that we have not addressed them, in my opinion, is precisely because of this deformed work which corporations attempt to benefit from as long as possible by making these campaign contributions to the politicians. And the lack of virtue ethics, which is the only thing that can slay the dragon, so to speak, of our egos, that is basically compensating for the lack of finding the infinite in God with searching for the infinite in the finite world of nature and thereby destroying it. So it sounds like um, you, you could say that holistic work reflects a pursuit of virtue and the deformed work, uh, there's no virtue involved, or let's say it's secular ethics, which are Nietzschean, essentially, and are void of ethics. But there are, there are how, how would you make this argument? So I guess your, your central point being that... Um, that major religious traditions offer a more holistic approach to production exchange processes because they pursue a virtue-based exchange means modes of exchange and production as opposed to uh, the secular version. Yet, yet, the secular world still produces what it calls ethics or attempts at ethics. How would you... Uh, how would you address that? Because certainly, if you're a secular, if you if you pursue 
if you're not a religious person and you live in a secular world and with a secular mindset, you'll say, well, I have ethics. Who are you to say that I don't have ethics? So how would you address that? Yeah, I know that. Mm. Yes. Uh, and it's, I, I don't mean to say that atheists and agnostics are bad people. I don't mean to say that at all. It's very possible that um, atheists and agnostics may be actually more ethical than believers. That's certainly a possibility. What I'm arguing instead is that atheists and agnostics have no intellectually sustainable position by which to argue that they should be ethical. And so therefore it represents a, more of a sentimental uh, element. I think that atheists and agnostics who act uh, ethically are really trying to pr pr prove to themselves that they can be good without God. <laughs> or, or you, or you could say it's the it's the ultimate form of cultural appropriation by taking basically the ethics of Christianity, uh, or or uh, or other major religious traditions such as Islam and and Judaism, and saying, well, well these are these are secular models. Um, but but really, like you said, there's no philosophical justification for being a good and virtuous person if all there is is atoms and the void. That's right. Uh, I asked you for a definition or of of holistic work, but how would you describe deformed work? Deformed work is not uh, spiritually or psychologically efficacious. Uh, but it is materially efficacious in the short term, but only because it can uh, the the effects of pollution uh, can occur later on. The, the later generations will bear the full costs of that pollution rather than those who are in the present. Deformed work cannot serve as a spiritual support for one who is engaged in it, nor should one attempt to make it a, a source of spiritual support. So believers may be enmeshed in a system that is based on deformed work, but they should not, and this could be just out of necessity, but they should not attempt to use that deformed work as a source of spiritual support. And the notion that people would voluntarily engage in deformed work is completely false when we look at the historical record. Perlman uh, has a, a, a wonderful uh, book in this regard in which, and I, I believe his name is Perlman, I might be mistaken in that, but in any case, there's a wonderful book that discusses the emergence of industrial capitalism. And all economists are trained to know about what are called the corn laws that basically uh, dealt with whether or not a country should, in, in this case, England, should avoid importing corn or just uh, producing it itself. And this led David Ricardo and others to speak about comparative advantage and then allow each country to produce what it has a relative advantage in doing so. And that helps, uh, makes everyone better off. But what is missing from the economic textbooks in terms of the history is that the game laws, what are called game laws, were much, much more extensively debated and discussed in parliament than the corn laws. And what the game laws required or allowed for was not only would people who are, say, hunting on uh, other people's lands for, uh, for food and, and so forth. But it also disallowed farmers, small farmers, from ridding the land of game that was eating their crops. And it also allowed for 
the wealthy who are on fox hunts and so forth to trample over the produce or the plants and uh, other things, the crops that the small farmers were uh, attempting to develop. And the game laws had draconian penalties for violating any of those conditions. So for example, the first time that you were violated the game laws, one would be uh, thrown into prison. Uh, second time one violated the game laws, a part of the person would be amputated. The th and then if it, a uh, third violation would lead to, you know, severe punishments. And so these game laws were designed to force people into the factories. People did not want that first generation would try to avoid industrial work as much as possible in every way that they could. But the game laws is what made it impossible for these that first generation to survive on their own without going into the factories. And so this idea that we had voluntarily adopted deformed work at the expense of holistic work is historically absolutely false. The move to industrial or deformed work was the result of coercion. It was not voluntary. I, so I want to, this area raises an interesting question because you make the point that um, a lot of these economic decisions have a real impact on the environment, on ecology, which um, really affects, uh, let's say, what what the two the two important things that you know the, that that which is beautiful, which is is beneficial for our spirit, and that which is material beneficial, that which is beneficial for our corporeal being. Um, but how how would you address something that's going on, let's say, in 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 Denmark, where you have a lot of independent farmers that, uh, uh, in the name of the environmental crisis, they are shutting down farmers and and concentrating production into uh, let's say central centralized production uh, to achieve economies of scale, which you mentioned before. So it seems to me. Um, here you're, uh, th there is a battle going on between, you know, property rights, the rights of the individual to pursue their own self-interest, to uh, produce, but you're also, like, I, I'm not sure that they're really solving an environmental issue by uh, centralizing production. Um, it, it seems to me there's a lot going on there, but I'm not sure if you're familiar with what's going on there and how you might address that in light of, of your research. Yeah. Unfortunately, I'm not familiar with, with what's going on there, but I'll be happy to look it up um, and because I'm, I'm interested in seeing what experiments are, you know, what are what's going on. But what I will say is that um, it is possible. So what 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 really is important is that they are using um, holistic approaches to agriculture, whether it's centralized or it's in um, you know, remains in private hands. Um, uh, I can understand one reason why they might want to centralize things to some extent in that they want to have coordination between the various producers so that, um, but at the same time, they shouldn't be owning the property. You know, the government should not be owning the property. It's It's a matter of, the government should just be facilitating coordination among the producers so that or the farmers so that they don't say for example overproduce or underproduce so that they have so that they maintain stable prices that are just for the farmers and for the consumers so in that sense uh coordination or cooperation you might say um would be justified but certainly not for the government to be pushing these um, smaller uh, farmers out of business. And uh, the whole idea of holistic agriculture as opposed to industrial agriculture is also very important. So if in this case, the 
are they're they're using for example artificial you know fertilizers uh, rather than you know traditional compost or things that are associated with organic farming then that's really terrible because with industrial farming it basically converts the soil into dirt and it's estimated that there are only 60 more harvests to obtain from that and so uh another problem associated with this is that this uh, is that soil acts as an enormous carbon sink and to the extent that we destroy soil through these artificial fertilizers uh, that destroys a carbon sink and at the same time we're increasing our emissions uh, so that we're going in the opposite direction in both ways both in terms of the sinks as well as the source another area that's also very problematic is industrial fishing where they drag these huge nets across the ocean, ocean floor and that winds up destroying another enormous carbon sink uh, that's kind of analogous to the amazon forest except it's at the water it's in the in the ocean and all of this are the result and i and i call them industrial farming industrial fishing and so forth and so on to illustrate how the industrialization leads to deformed work that harms both man and nature and so the only way to resolve this is through the recovery of a spiritual uh, uh is world view it requires a spiritual renewal yeah point well taken and i should issue a correction i said denmark i i should have said the dutch the dutch farmers which of course is the netherlands a uh, completely different country but um i think your your proposal of uh making arrangements for ensuring that not too much is being produced or how production uh, goes about is uh would be is is something that that could be looked it would be an interesting case study i think for your for your research because um it seems to me that the 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 method being at least what's being publicized is is essentially the government is incentivizing them to leave farming uh, uh so that they can um the government can own the land uh, and either return it i'm not sure to its natural state or to use it for other means of production i'm not sure exactly what all the ins and outs of it are but i guess what i was getting at in that point was to ask well if if in the name of let's say environmental protection you're taking farmland and then you're forcing those farmers into a work that they didn't volunteer for which might be just another corporate job like learn to program is is uh you know the 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 ongoing meme that we have which is a form of deformed work and no one would choose well certainly not a farmer would choose programming for their livelihood uh, by and large um so it seems to me that there, there's it's a complicated issue it's it's um yes. and uh and, so and that's why i had asked i had asked earlier if if um if you're proposing a, a system or just a change in consci consciousness or conscientiousness about how we go about mm. our how we conceive things in yes. the market really i'm i'm proposing both um but i know i understand what we're up against with the corporate interests and therefore i don't have any uh illusions that this is going to be implemented on a wide scale but my main focus is to contribute intellectual clarity to the discussion because many people seem are either think that good intentions or spiritual intentions are sufficient to make deformed work holistic on the one hand and on the other 
uh, many people, many even devout believers are very concerned that religion doesn't really speak to the crises that we face at every turn. And so the book is there to let them know that religion is relevant, that, you know, we do not need to have the position that religion is pushed to the periphery in public discourse over these issues. Yes, it seems to me that uh, the absence of religion or the absence of a higher ontology uh, is what leads to a decision making that focuses on efficiency rather than what's good for the human person, what's good for uh, the environment, what's good for culture, the development of culture, because all of this is tied to culture ultimately. And if your culture is efficiency and profit, um, then you really don't have a culture. Right. You and have efficiency you know, and profit. Yes. And I would add that it's not truly efficient. Hmm. It's not when you factor in all of the costs, it is not more efficient than holistic. Uh, well, you might say it's efficient in the short term and the immediate term to certain interests, but in the long term, it's inefficient because it's so costly. That's right. And it basically passes costs on to future generations. That's the bottom line. And so it's unethical. It's also not efficient in the following sense. For something to be efficient, there must be a stable goal for efficiency to apply itself to. And that requires that people's preferences be consistent, internally consistent. So if someone prefers A to B, and B to C, let's say bundles of A, bundles, a bundle of goods in option A, a bundle of goods in option B, and a bundle of goods in option C. If one prefers A to B and B to C, then those preferences are internally consistent. However, only the saints are really internally consistent. The rest of us have, because our what integrates the psyche is the spirit. And what integrates the soul is the psyche. So there's the, the, um, the body is, is the psyche. So we're, we consist of body, soul, spirit. And when the soul is no longer in the body, then the body disintegrates. That's what death is all about. And when the spirit is not there, it is not integrating the psyche and so efficiency has no meaning without the spirit you might say it's vertical causality in psychology and so if someone is a miser or a hedonist or an egoist in any way they are not they do not have internally consistent preferences and if there are no internally consistent preferences, then there is nothing that serves as the object of efficiency. So efficiency becomes an inherently incoherent concept outside of spiritual values. This makes sense. I think um, I'm trying to digest this a little bit when you um, you speak about um, the nature of of man as being body, psyche, or soul, and spirit. Um, Wolfgang also, this is a, Wolfgang calls uh, he, he, the tripartite nature of man, but um, which, which is, is consistent with Christianity. And, I, and I, I'm unfamiliar, but I, I assume Islam as well holds yeah. the same view of, of man. Very interesting. Yes. And so, so if you remove the spirit, you're left with body and psyche. And if you're a materialist, use that term loosely, since we don't know what material is, mm -hmm. uh, which is a, a principle of receptivity. We had that conversation with Rafael de Paola. But um, if you're just uh, body and spirit or psyche, I'm sorry, body and soul or psyche, well, what is psyche? Now you're trapped in that Cartesian dilemma 
where psyche to a materialist is merely, merely a product of, of material. So material uh, achieves complexity, creates consciousness, that consciousness is an illusion, and now you're stuck in Rene Descartes' uh, a dilemma of res cogitans on the one hand and res extense on the other. It's things extended in space, those those bodies which we, we know objectively exist, and then res cogitans, things of the mind. Of course, how can we know that res extense actually exist, thing, extended entities, if if everything is an illusion of our mind? So it's a it's a it's an it's an endless trap you're stuck in, and this is really the trap of materialism because they don't recognize the spiritual realm, they don't acknowledge it, that there is a side of our being that exists outside of the time space continuum and is in fact spirit, and it's a higher level of ontological order, and without it you can't make sense of reality. Right. Is that and fair to say? Yes, yes. It, it, it serves in two respects in, when related to economics. The first is that of symbolism because there can be no symbolism if without the spirit without the spiritual dimension because what is symbolic is symbolizing higher levels of reality and therefore fulfilling our spiritual needs through that remembrance uh but on the other side it's on the in the might the efficiency will have no meaning if there are not internally consistent preferences and so therefore economists cannot use or cannot invoke restraints on uh you might say certain forms of economic activity let's say for example body parts the sale of body parts or prostitution or uh any of these other um those are basically the same thing yeah, right, exactly, exactly. On the basis that this is uh, efficient. Because any form of degrading uh, work or deformed work is going to be inherently inefficient because it's based on preferences that are not internally consistent. And so the ontology, vertical causality, is necessary for both the symbolism of the product of the artifacts that we make on one hand that fulfill the spiritual needs of both the maker and the patron. And on the other hand, vertical causality is necessary to integrate our preferences on uh, for in economic activity by which we can define efficiency. So economists cannot use, cannot use the argument of efficiency to reject moral constraints in economic activity. Very interesting. I, I want to add, um, it's so interesting that you're making this argument about holistic and deformed work. Uh, I mentioned at the beginning of our conversation, this book, um, Leisure, the Basis of Culture. It's really a collection of two um, public talks that was given by the author, Josef Pipa, who was writing in post-World War II Germany while they were going through the reconstruction period. And he talks about, you know, this distinction between the liberal arts and um and servile work. And this that we've we're quickly entering an age, especially at that time, of of total work, of total labor, um, in order to gain, he, he writes here. So, well, I should point out that the name of our podcast is the is Project Scola. And it was John Trevor Berger who pulled this out because uh, he, the word uh, comes from the Greek skole, and in Latin schola, where we get the English word school, the word used to designate the place where we educate and teach is derived from a word that literally means leisure, but not in the contemporary sense of sitting on the beach with a pina colada. The, con the, con the original conception of leisure, he writes here, as it arose in the civilized world of Greece has become unrecognized in the in the world of of planned diligence and total labor so in fact the 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 leisure we're talking about here is is the part that makes us more human the mm -hmm. study that you talked about um well you made the point about writing poetry you know oh, you adam, don't, you, smith. adam smith 
um, when you not having the time to write poetry, well, or writing poetry, poetry or to, to read, read poetry, poetry. Yes, yes. or to contemplate or to, you know, to philosophize. These are all acts of leisure. And we live in a world now of total labor of uh, even our schools are kind of, well, really, they're designed like factories in the sense you you put the school, the kids in, you put them through a process, you spit them out the other side. <laughs> Yeah. Um, as opposed to the master pupil uh, format of antiquity, um, which focused also on the the sort of the liberal arts, the the virtue, the formation of virtues in students. Now we focus on science, technology, engineering, and math. The STEM um, that is that's the focus. Uh, so our, our our marketplace is a world of total labor, and our schools are on. Uh, producing productive people uh, to the exclusion of virtue because we live in a relativistic world. And, well, what is virtue? Who can say what virtue is these days? You know, economists like to, um, you know, that quote from T.S. Eliot, the, the dream of systems so perfect that no one will need to be good. Economists, really, that's that's kind of what their goal is. Um, they want to develop a system that will take account of negative externalities, whether it's through carbon taxes or cap trade, you know, cap and trade uh, uh, technical economic solutions to the environmental crisis. But those are never going to work for the reasons that we discussed earlier. Um, economics cannot be a separate domain from the rest of uh, social life because the rest of social life we understand that intentions do matter for good outcomes and economists want to make the claim that really intentions are irrelevant for good outcomes and so it constitutes a separate domain from the rest of social life and um, so the holistic versus deformed work has very, very important implications for economic theory because it it uh, rejects that separate domain argument. John Trevor uh, brought up the notion that um, both communism and capitalism are forms of totalitarianism. Hmm. I don't know if I would go that far. I certainly would say that about communism. Uh, capitalism, I'd say, can it can reach that point in the sense that uh, you know, your entire life, if, there, if you don't have the scola part of your life, if it's completely consumed by capitalist pursuits, then yes, you're, you live in a world of totalist work and it's a form of totalitarianism. And I certainly feel that way around this time of year when taxes are due and today happens to be tax day, but yeah. um, Thank God I can't feel... escape the IRS. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> But you know what? What what I argue in in the book is that both um, industrial capitalism and industrial communism are much closer to each other than many people think, precisely because of the uh, deformed work. Both mm -hmm. of them support deformed deformed work, and special interests just simply take on different forms. So, for example, the special interest in industrial co capitalism is are clear. They're the corporatocracy that's going on by contributing to uh, political campaigns. But the special interests that emerge in industrial communism are even worse in the sense that the bureaucrats who are running the agencies basically identify their self-interest and the interests of their bureaucracy with the interests of the whole. And so you get even more dysfunctional forms in industrial communism than you do in industrial capitalism, which is why the environmental crisis was so awful in the Soviet Union. It was even worse than it was under mm. industrial capitalism. And there are some authors who go so far as to say that the collapse of the Soviet Union was more due to the environmental crisis that people were seeing than it was to you know the factors we usually associate with the decline of the Soviet Union. So yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I agree that the industrial capitalism and industrial communism have a lot more in common than people tend to think. But if we're going to rate them, definitely industrial communism is worse, even on an environmental scale, than industrial capitalism. 
Whereas we'd think that it would be the opposite because collective, you would think that the government would take into account those negative externalities in setting prices and, and, and so forth, but that's not the case. So it's like back to the way of Aristotle or the way of Nietzsche. Yeah, it's interesting um, that you brought up the notion of bureaucracy because I get more and more the feeling that the, the country we live in is becoming more and more of an administrative state um, than it is uh, a, a free functioning society or free functioning culture. Um, but but that's that's another discussion. One of the things that always uh, interests me is um, because recently I've been I've been out um, searching for a home, and uh, just the way that uh, cities are planned and designed yes. in the United States, like in Fort Worth. It's designed for economic efficiency. You have your suburbs, your industrial area. It seems to make very sense from from a, an efficient standpoint, but it's really dehum it's really dehumanizing. Yeah, yeah. Um, you spend all your time in the car in traffic. By the time you get to your neighborhood, you go right into your garage, right into your living room to sit on the couch, which is designed to stare at the television. Mm -hmm. um, you know, your your the front of your home is your driveway. Where you don't really engage with anybody it's just the road and then your backyard is fenced in so we we live in so many ways apart from our neighbors and, and if you look at the ancient ways of, of the way towns and cities were designed you had maybe the the church or the, uh or a, a mosque or a temple in the center and and that's where the market the center of the marketplace was the center of worship the center of exchange um uh, I'm not saying that everything was better back then. Obviously, you had disease and all, uh, you know, corruption of every kind uh, just just then as well. But nowadays, you know, I was lamenting the fact that, uh, you know, I, I moved thousands of miles away from my family to live in a community of strangers uh, to try to get a sense of community. Yeah. Um, and, and it is a nice community. I've met my neighbors and so on, but it, it's just... Uh, even the design, the architecture of our cities just is, is a, it's a facade. It's a Potemkin village in a way. Yes. Yes. Actually, I have a section in the, in chapter one that deals with that. Oh, interesting. I'd be interesting to read that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, wouldn't you say that, or could you say that there is a distinction between, let's say, capitalism and corporatism? Um, and I bring this up because, um, and maybe because there's also the term free enterprise um, in, in persons, you know, we're born free. Uh, we're, we're supposed to be free to, to choose God, free, free to reject God, free. We're free agents in this world. Um, and to the extent that we make free choices and those are good free choices, a free enterprise system should is the only way to reflect virtue because if we're compelled to do certain things, how can we be virtuous? And so a free enterprise activity, a, free, a system that, that is free enterprise is a good thing. Is free enterprise the same thing as capitalism? And is capitalism the same thing as corporatism? Because you know, I brought up the example of how cities are planned that to me is a form of corporatism because um, you know, the mayor or the, the 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 council answers to different economic needs. Well, you know, we've got Amazon moving in here. They're going to build, I, I shouldn't pick on Amazon, but I just used it because they're going to build a, a huge facility over here. It's going to employ a whole bunch of people. It's going to bring in tax revenue. Um, then we're going to be able to build schools. Um, and that's going to bring in the real estate developers. who are going to plow all that land and chop down on those trees and build all these homes which means we need roads and so on. Um, so it looks like progress. It's uh, uh, sometimes it looks like Mad Max when it's being built. Um, it might take, I don't know, 20, 30, 50 years for the trees to grow back. Um, we don't know the impact of what was displaced, but um, I guess, I, I, I mean, I would, it's hard to find an alternate system to free enterprise. I should be free to exchange with people. You're not saying that free exchange of goods and services is bad. Capitalism merely uses the capital that we gain in order to um, uh, purchase and engage in the market. And then there's corporatism, which is kind of, I view that as special interest driven. 
So yeah. that was a really long question. I wonder if you it, thought. No, no, no. I, I hear what you're saying. Um, basically, there's a difference between capitalism and industrial capitalism. That's wow. what it comes down to. And so in uh, in traditional Islamic civilization, there was no word for, or there was no science of economics understood in its current sense, despite tremendous economic activity. And that's precisely because economics was not a separate, it was not a domain separated from the rest of social life. In other words, it was still looked upon as something in which intentions matter. Things are not observationally equivalent. When we come to exchange processes, things may appear to be sometimes observationally equivalent, but when it comes to production processes, that's where they definitely are not observationally equivalent. And so you have a real choice there between capitalism and industrial capitalism. But there's a difference between choices within an economic system and choices between economic systems. And uh, we have a choice between economic systems in the sense that you know we can select one that has holistic work and is a holistic economy uh, rel open, instead of uh, choice to adopt a, def you know, a deformed economy. But once we've adopted the economic system, then our choices within the system become uh, more limited. And uh, Paul Haney um, is uh, basically took the view that in, uh, in our current economy based on a high division of labor. He said that it's not so much that people are selfish as it is that things are impersonal and that we do not because we cannot put other people's preferences ahead of our own simply because we don't know enough about them. And that works when it comes to exchange processes to some extent, but it presupposes uh, a deformed work at the very beginning, because deformed work is what uh, leads to this kind of um, uh, non-tuism, you might say. Whereas in a holistic economy, you can always, um, there, th there's the issue of self-respect that comes there for good, uh, fair wages and, and prices. But I have another question because uh, in, in the United States, we often hear about uh, what's what's sometimes termed the Protestant work ethic. Mm -hmm. um, how would how does that play in? Or I know this you don't discuss it in your book, but I wonder how that concept might play in. Is it possible to, to derive dignity and virtue through what might I, might otherwise be termed deformed work? So it's is deformed work simply the labor that you would otherwise not do, but you're forced to do in order to make ends meet. Um, but you can still derive virtue from doing that work, couldn't you? I, and I'm, I'm throwing that, that Protestant work in, ethic in there. You, you need to be busy. You need to be productive in order to be a good person. I don't, I'm not sure if that's an accurate reflection, but you get my meaning. Perhaps. Yes, yes, I do. I do. Um, if one does not, many people don't have a choice. I mean, first of all, in this society, we're not educated even on the distinction between holistic and deformed work. If we don't even know the distinction between science and scientism, oftentimes, let alone these other applications. So long as the good that is being produced is a necessity, rather than uh, a kind of luxury good, and that they perform the work as perfectly as they can, and that they dedicate that to God in whatever way that you can. So in that sense, uh, work, deformed work can contribute uh, to some uh, limited degree uh, to virtue, but uh, for most people, uh, it's not going to have that effect and it would be much better because they cannot use it as a spiritual support. 
they might be able to try to develop certain aspects of virtue and so forth in that deformed work. But ultimately, it can't be used as a spiritual support. And if they had the option between holistic and deformed work, they would certainly choose the holistic work over the deformed work. But our society is uh, organized around deformed work, and there have been a lot of um, collective choices that have been made that make it extremely difficult to make the shift from deformed to holistic work. One of the things that interests me is, um, I think there's a, a, a legal angle to this as well, because if you're going to engage in economics, you have to have rules about what constitutes property and how to interpret property laws. You, you mentioned, you know, the pursuit of, of game on land. And I was, I was thinking about, you know, one of the first cases you learn in, in law school is, is um, Post versus Pearson. And it's these two uh, landowners pursuing a fox. Well, um, the post is, is he, he, he initiates the pursuit of the fox with his horses and, uh, Pearson gets the fox first, but doesn't put any effort into the labor of pursuing the fox. But so, so post initiates a lawsuit against Pearson for ownership of the fox. And so the judge has to decide on who owns the fox, you know, was it the labor that went into pursuing the fox or was it Pearson in the first come first serve? So this goes to one of those. There are different theories about um, property ownership. That one being, uh, you know, first protection of first possession. Um, the other one is uh, when someone mixes their labor with the land, it becomes theirs. Um, utilitarian, uh, you know, how uh, you know that it serves the common good. Um, but there's also a personhood theory of of property ownership that it facilitates democracy or facilitates. Um, it's vital for, I'm sorry, th that would be the, the civic Republican, but the personhood is that it's necessary for person's individual personal development. Each person has a close emotional or, or human investment in that property. So I think there might be um, some ample room for discussion on how property theory might apply to um, the notion of, of how these economic exchanges might might go forward um you know where do we where do we place the emphasis on, from a legal aspect um on uh on, on the means of production you know you gave the example of you know basically dredging the bottom of the ocean floor with these massive nets scooping up everything and destroying a lot of different types of uh, uh forms of life that that they're not trying to catch. They're catching sharks. They're catching whales. They're catching. They're killing all kinds of other sea sea life that they just end up being cast away and thrown out. Yeah, and um, destroying the ocean floor, the plants. And on destroying the ocean floor. Exactly. That's, that's the carbon sink. Exactly. So, so this idea of you know, who owns the ocean floor and why do they own it and uh, what what theory of property do we apply there? So, it would be an interesting uh interesting angle to pursue i think yeah um, but i'm not a legal expert so yeah i just well, know some of the basics yeah no but i mean they shouldn't be uh you know uh, fishing in that way at all that's a form of industrial fishing that is not holistic and it's a type of deformed work um and uh, to return to the question of the fox uh was it was it there was the case just um a, a question of like hunting a fox for sport or were they going to eat the fox uh if i remember correctly i think the 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 purpose of hunting the fox was uh both sport and to uh protect their livestock at least in the one case i think for post it was livestock i don't want to misstate it i haven't read the case in a long time but okay. well, um, the only reason that i ask is because in islam of course, it's 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 uh, forbidden to hunt animals just for sport, um, and uh, there's a, a a work ethic. Let's say, for example, it's raining, and somebody takes a bucket of water, uh, a bucket, and gathers the water, 
then that water belongs to that person uh, because they've made some effort. And in the same way, if there's, a, you know, say some desert, and the person cultivates things uh, to convert that into something productive, then that person owns that uh, that piece of land. So the idea is, is that there should always be some kind of effort. But on the other hand, if, uh, say, someone who is uh, dying of thirst uh, approaches that person who has the bucket of water, it is required that that person uh, gives the person who's dying of thirst water, and it's even uh, uh, obligatory, practically, that if the person who owns the water doesn't give it to him, that it's completely all right for that person to steal the water. <laughs> and it's kind of like St. Thomas Aquinas's statement that you know, a drowning man has the right to go into somebody else's boat uh, just out of necessity. I think in the in the Pierce or Post versus Pearson case, uh, it was merely the fact that uh, fox were considered nuisance animals, uh, and so you you simply had a right to eliminate these nuisance animals, these uh, fieri naturae, these natural feral animals that. Uh, Pose a nuisance to you as a property owner, as a as a owner of uh, um, cattle or what have you, goats, sheep. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But that All also right. actually uh, that comprises a potential danger. I don't know if you um, you know the wolves in Yellowstone. Yes. The park, you know that kind of upsets the the. You're upsetting the ecosystem, the the balance. Yeah, I, I understood. Yes. Yeah. So, is there is there something that uh, have we addressed the central premise of your book so far? Have we yeah. Got there? Yeah, I think so. I mean, the the key is uh, the key points this uh, we have um, discussed the distinction between holistic and deformed work that many people feel that religion doesn't speak to the uh, crises that they face at every turn, whereas actually religion does, uh, if we understand how to apply it. And that's and Wolfgang Smith's work is very central in that regard because economics is at the bottom of the intellectual food chain in the sense that it accepts, it takes its axioms from other sciences. And so uh, holistic work requires an ontology that uh, is based on the work of Wolfgang Smith, and that once production processes are holistic, then there are exchange processes will be holistic. There's an element of self-respect that is concerns both sides to an exchange that it should be fair uh, for both sides, and uh, it therefore transcends this uh, dichotomy between egoism and altruism <laughs> that lacks insufficient reason that economists discuss. And um, that um, all of this is obviously radically different from the um, in current industrial capitalism, socialism, and communism. And so a lot of the work on uh, Islamic economics, for example, tries to say that um, it, it can be an amalgam of the three, which it's not reducible to any of them in any way. And that the only way to address current the current global crises, uh, such as climate change and socioeconomic instability are intrinsic to these contemporary economic systems and their corresponding economic theories. Uh, all of which suffer from a truncated worldview that Wolfgang Smith uh, provides an, uh, a, a true alternative, a valid alternative to. And so uh, we cannot, uh, most of economists often try to address uh, such crises through technical market solutions 
but that's equivalent to as T.S. Eliot said, dreaming of systems so perfect that nobody will need to be good, no one will need to be good, and that's why um, that at best addresses symptoms rather than the underlying uh, causes, uh, and uh, it's useful to think about economics in religious terms, regardless of one's position on on religion uh, itself. Yeah, it seems to me part of the point you're making and and um, is that in a sense, in this sense, in a utilitarian sense, capitalism and socialism, communism are in a sense two sides of the same coin. If right. it's put in terms of the person, the human person is a utility to make the system function. So right. in communism, uh, you obliterate all hierarchies. You have one hierarchy that decides who gets what, how much of what. And the whole purpose of the person is to produce in order to make the system work so that everybody has an equal share. Whereas capitalism, I mean, all you have to listen do is listen to our politicians talk about jobs, jobs, jobs. They don't talk about what the human person needs, the development of virtuous. How do we how do we create virtuous people in a great nation? No, it's about jobs and economic output. Um, the best nations to live in are always uh, uh, described in terms of their GDP or economic output or how much they provide in social services and whatnot, rather than what kind of people they produce, the, the virtuous people. And so what you're arguing is we need to rethink how we engage in economic activity, production, and exchange in what in in virtuous terms what's good for the human person how do we become better people through our exchanges in production right and the key starting point is production mm -hmm. production processes will uh, will inform and determine really exchange processes so the the whole key is holistic work in production processes which will then lead to whole work or holistic work <clears throat> you say in exchange processes so if we don't start from the beginning with the production processes which are informed by a holistic science and technology that Wolfgang Smith brings to the table then the rest of the system is is lost it will necessarily be deformed yeah this necessity for an ontology just seems to apply everywhere I mean if you, if you grow up in a in the secular mindset that you're basically an amalgamation of quantum particles um, that coalesced to form things and which became more complex and uh, created consciousness. Um, you're evolved from apes. You're, you're going back to the earth. You have no soul. Um, there's nothing higher. We live in a flat cosmos in time and space. We're all going to expire, and uh, but you can you can get a good job. <laughs> and I think you know it's funny because we, we John and I talk about well, you you hear this going on in, in pop culture among among other pugnant or um, um, uh, um, speakers, whether it's Jordan Peterson or Pajot or Vicky talking about the meaning crisis. We have a meaning. We have people walking into school shooting them up. Uh, uh, it seems like we've lost morality. People say, well, it's, it's, it's gun violence or it's, uh, you know, people need uh, better psychology or something. But really, it, it, it's two things. I think it's a crisis. John and I really say, well, really, it's a, it's a problem of a higher order. It's a crisis of truth because everything you're told about your nature is wrong. It's false. Um, you're not just an amalgamation of quantum particles evolved from apes. Um, and, uh, and, you know, so we need to understand what the truth is first, um, and then you can understand your meaning and your purpose in this world. Um, uh, but it's it's really a spiritual crisis uh, yeah. in many ways. It, there's, which you know, we talked about um, body, psyche, and spirit. If you don't have spirit, if you don't even acknowledge that spirit exists, this higher level of intellect, this meaning that allows you to understand the metaphysical reality of of what appears to us to be mundane actually has a very deep metaphysical meaning. And this is the argument that Wolfgang Smith is making is we need to return to the ancients, the, 
returned to the scholastics, they were much wiser. They understood that, um, you know, we're not just efficient producers of products to be consumed. We're tripartite beings with a transcendent reality that, that transcends time and space. Yes, yes. And Brian Keeble has, has a wonderful um, um, saying in that regard. It, the question is not what we get from work in terms of income and so forth, but what do we get by working? Or by work. So it's not just what we get for work, but what we get by work. Walid, I wanted to bring up the, if you discuss at all in your book, the notion of the tragedy of the commons. Oh, yes. Yes, absolutely. Yes. And by that, for the benefit of listeners, would be the situation in which individuals have access to a public resource or a public good, called the, also called the common, and by acting in their own interest, in doing so, they deplete, ultimately deplete the resource. Yes. Yes, absolutely. And that comes, uh, you know, if work is deformed, then there will be many tragedies of the commons. So, right. to speak. but if so it harms the commons by by pursuing your own self interest in a public area, you actually end up harming the commons in the in the long term. Right. Yes. Yeah. The 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 term that's used and what I mentioned in the book is, um, and it's adopted from uh, from another economist too, with the history of economics text. Uh, basically, by pursuing our own self interest. We, you know, Adam Smith talks about by pursuing our interests, we uh, are led as if by an invisible hand to promote the social welfare more than we would even if we tried to do it consciously. Well, there's a flip side to it, to the invisible hand that's called the invisible foot. <laughs> and the invisible foot maximizes the harm to society, even if it was not part of the intention of the of the actor to do so it's a very hilarious quote because it takes adam smith's invisible hand and then puts the invisible foot and just switches benefits to to negative outcomes and so it's very funny and that is uh that does happen with deformed work that's the key because there is the choice of deformed work commits oneself to secular philosophical ethics and in secular philosophical ethics it's the way of aristotle or the way of nietzsche and then it's it's over one cannot reinsert the ethics into the system so economic the current system is absolutely unsustainable and we have to have a spiritual renewal or recovery as wolfgang smith says in the, in the entire culture for us to get out of it but i think it's going to be it's going to take the second coming of Christ. Either it's going to be a massive, massive environmental catastrophe to wake people up, or it's Christ's second coming. Well, it's been a pleasure speaking with you. Yeah, it's um, been a pleasure to... This is such an interesting uh, and fascinating topic, and I'd like to have you back on again. And Do you have a title for your book yet, or are you still working on that? Yes, no, it's called Jihad and Islamic Economics, Economic Thinking in an Era of Global Crises. And so how would you define jihad for, for the benefit of the audience in this term? Yes, uh, well, jihad has a hierarchy of levels of meaning. Um, the most outer meaning is defense of the Islamic world from uh, uh, attack and defending the borderlands and so forth. But it has an inner meaning as well. And this is reflected in the fact that the prophet of Islam after the first battle of Bedl that threatened the nascent uh, Islamic community, they were being attacked by the uh, people from Mecca. Uh, he said, you have returned from the smaller battle to the bigger battle. And they were like shocked. You know, what could be a bigger battle than what we just did that threatened the community? And he said, it's to fight your carnal soul. Basically, anything that separates us inwardly from God. And applied to economics, there was uh, a young man 
who was running through an area where the prophet of Islam was uh, marshalling his troops. And someone said, you know, I wish this young man would come and uh, join us and so forth. And the prophet of Islam said, if he's running to provide for himself and his family and so forth, then he is in the way of God. He's striving in the way of God. And jihad comes from the root jihada, which means to strive. And obviously he has a positive comment, a connotation in terms of striving in the way of God. And so the uh, meaning of jihad can go all the way from the spiritual inward combat that one is facing against one's carnal soul, as, as Christ said, uh, think, you know, I have not come for peace, but I come with the sword, you know, fighting for the truth inwardly, yeah. uh, all the way to social um, obligations when President Carter, former President Carter, for example, helps with Habitat for Humanity to solve the problem of housing for the poor. He's not going to obviously solve it by himself, but he's just a very salutary example for the rest of us to, you know, doing uh, one's, the Lord's prayer, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That should really be the second one in terms of the hierarchy. The first one at the top being the spiritual inward combat. The second being to do God's will. Uh, and then the third is um, to you know, engage in other work or engage in other activities to benefit others. And then the lowest level would be that external battle and physical battle. So the jihad has a relationship to Islamic economics, both in terms of spiritual realization through work, as well as through the striving uh, to do work, as well as um, striving to meet uh, the needs of society and the needs of, of one's family. I love that example of the, the man running home to protect his family, because I think that's emblematic of just where we are as a, as a society. We, we really need to start with the family and protect our families. Um, that's, that's the source of all economics. That's the source of all faith. Um, it's, it's the foundation of every nation. It's the foundation of all cultures. And um, to the extent that we focus um, our efforts on um, protecting our families and, and, you know, this, you know, I, I, I asked you the question whether, you know, how, how you would go about this transformation. And I think it's it really a, a key part to begin is in the home there. Um, yes with yes. your family and raising your children with this mindset, with this uh, view towards the world that is holistic and not deformed. Right, right, absolutely. And and I should just clarify, he was running uh, not only to protect his family, but to provide for them. Yeah, yeah. The name of your book, one more time, for the benefit of the audience. Jihad in Islamic Economics, Economic Thinking in an Era of Global Crises. And when do you anticipate being complete with the book? Uh, I hope to complete it this summer, and then it will go to um, the publishers. Uh, I'm I'm working out a, a, a few proposals to publishers now, and uh, hopefully we'll get a response before too long. Terrific. Um, so I, I want to thank you again. I'm always so fascinated to learn from you. Um, and uh, especially because I'm, I'm I'm constantly making Christian references, and I have to remind myself that you know it's so fascinating to me to see the, the similarities of uh, I'm reminded of my ignorance of Islam, but it's uh, um, the similarities are just invaluable to me, and and it 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 uh, just reminds me why you're a part of the the foundation and and your your. Your participation is so key and so valuable, and uh, I, I think more people need to hear from you, which is why we asked you to be on the show. Yeah, thank you very much. The tears down, keep tearing down. The killers keep on killing, and the dead keep coming around. 
world of Albert Einstein There is no solid ground to build on but the